Good evening. <laughs> Welcome. My name is George Breslauer. I have the privilege of serving as the faculty director of the Magnus. Thank you for joining us this evening uh, for the fall 2018 opening of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. Now, <clears throat> unlike at past openings, I'm not going to tell you what you already know. Uh, I'm not going to mention, for example, that the Magnus is the third largest collection of Ju Judaica objects in the United States. Uh, no, I'm not going to mention that. And I, I'm not going to reprise either that it's the largest university collection of Judaica objects in the world. I won't, no, I won't repeat that because you've heard that before. And I'm not going to mention that we continue to expand our holdings through donations of collections and archives, such as the Arthur Schick. Uh, collection and archive uh, donated to the Magnus by Tad Toby and his family. Um, the, the Mark and Peachy Levy uh, family collection of Judaica, the Barbara Shiloh collection, and many others. And I'm not going to tease you either by mentioning that we're going to have another blockbuster announcement in the next two months. Uh, now, I'm not going to reprise such institutional self-congratulation. Uh, rather, what I want to do is take this opportunity to honor the staff of the Magnus who make all of this possible. They're the people you usually don't see. They're the people working every day to catalog and digitize the 17,000 items in our collection which entails a tremendous amount of work funded by grants from foundations that expect us to deliver on time and on budget. Uh, they're the people behind the scenes who are researching, designing, and constructing the new exhibitions and programs of lectures and performances that are all based on the objects in our collection. They're the people who are organizing, advertising, and coordinating the logistics of everything we do. They're the people that are working to raise funds that are indispensable to our sustainability. In all, they're doing a huge amount of work on many fronts. There's the curatorial staff, many of whom you'll see credited in the signage and the brochures about our exhibitions tonight. Zoe Lewin, curatorial assistant. Shir Kohavi, assistant curator. Julie Franklin, registrar. Ernest Jolly, preparator. Rebecca Heisinger, assistant registrar. And Francesco Spagnolo, curator and curatorial man manager. Plus the many student researchers who intern at the Magnus under the direction of the curatorial staff in order to help with the research that leads to these exhibitions and programs. Then there's the administrative staff. Jean Marie Asituro, who's the Director of Administration at the Magnus. Lisa Marie Davis, Events Coordinator. These titles don't really summarize what they do because they do everything required from an administrative standpoint to make things work, whether it's managing our website or our publications or whatever comes up. They keep us functional. And then there's our Development Director, Claudia Cohan who next month will be retiring into a very well-deserved retirement. She's worked tirelessly to raise funds for the Magnus for the past six years. It takes over $1 million a year to run the Magnus. We have no permanent budget line from the university, so we're constantly in fundraising mode. And so as long as I have a captive audience, we rely. <laughs> We rely on your generosity, and we hope we can count on it, either through current gifts or through bequests. But now, let's go to the program, and let me yield the podium to Francesco Spagnolo, curator extraordinaire, who will introduce the program for this evening. Thank you, George. I guess I should not mention that the slideshow that was running here stopped on an advertisement for a Jewish people's bank. <laughs> I shouldn't mention that, right? Instead, I will play the slideshow again that highlights what's uh, in the exhibition. But uh, hint, hint. 
well, I'm really delighted to present what I would uh, call the Fall 2018 Exhibition Trifecta. Sometimes things have a way of aligning. And so, item number one. Both of the exhibitions that are opening uh, this fall began with the impotence of two mighty young women. So I want to acknowledge them. Uh, Zoe Lewin's name was, uh, was uh, mentioned before. Zoe was a um, um, recurrent uh, undergraduate research student. She, she, she kept coming back and wanting more, and we wanted more of her, so she was actually hired to be a curatorial assistant, but she's risen way above that, and she uh, really single-handedly documented the quasi-unknown life and work of Yaakov ben Kalter, a Polish immigrant to Palestine who reinvented, arrived to Palestine and reinvented himself as a photographer and a graphic designer. Somewhere along the, the way, he picked up Bauhaus, but we don't know exactly how, but he did it. And he was working for both the British colonial authorities and Zionist enterprises, often documenting the same sites, but with very different photographic eyes. So uh, Project Holy Land in our uh, in our hallway uh, gallery is displayed, and it's really the brainchild of, of Zoe, so I really want to thank her, since I have the microphone, I want to thank her on behalf of all of us. And then Rebecca Levitan, a graduate student, now doctoral candidate actually in the history of art, approached me, uh, we were both involved in projects with digital humanities at Berkeley, but approached me to research an area in the Magnus collection that was underserved and also much dreaded by all of us in, in collections, uh, that is ancient coins. Uh, dreaded because they're tiny, they're difficult to interpret, and also it's, an, it's a territory that's fraught with forgeries, so you never know what you're touching. And uh, from there, a whole exhibition ensued, and Pièce de Résistance, our uh, key exhibition for the fall, was born. Rebecca Levitan could not be with us today. She was accepted for an important fellowship in the UK, uh, which I may note is uh, geographically very, very close to where her boyfriend lives, but you know, it's still, it was a very, no, it's actually a very important fellowship. And, and since she, she, she passed her comps, she's been flying all over the world. She's, she's an archeologist, she's on, on, on sites all over the place, et cetera. But she left us a very, it's, it was very 20th century of her, but she left us a video message, so I'm going to play it for you, uh, where she tells us about her involvement uh, in uh, uh, this project. So hopefully the audio will work. My name is Rebecca Levitan. I'm a PhD candidate in the History of Art Department, where I study the art and architecture of the ancient world. While participating in a tour of the Magnus in 2016, I noticed that the collection contained a number of coins ranging from the ancient to modern worlds. This immediately captured my interest for two reasons. The first is that I'd worked on coins from the Roman provinces for my master's thesis, and although my primary research is now on sculpture and architecture, I was still on the lookout for numismatic material at Berkeley. The second, and more important, was that I had already been thinking about the theme of resistance and how it can be manifested in objects, and has been for millennia. The ancient world was a highly visual place. You could read, and information was passed most quickly and efficiently in the form of images. For that reason, ancient objects which employ political and religious iconography can tell the story of revolutions and resistance movements, both successful and failed. Coins, which have the additional advantages of being simple, datable, and highly communicative, are the best examples of this. Ancient coins often look just like the coins we carry in our own pockets. They're small, they portray notable leaders, they include the date in which they were minted. These features have changed very little in three millennia, and they make coins some of the most valuable resources for historians and archeologists studying the ancient world. Through their iconography, coins provide valuable information about ancient governments, languages, and religion. Just like today, the limited surface area on coins allowed the designer to include only images that conveyed particularly highly symbolic meanings. The ancient area of Judea and its surroundings have a special relationship with coinage. For hundreds of years, foreign rulers from the Persians in the 6th century BC to the Byzantines in the 4th century AD reinforced their control over the region. They continuously adjusted its name and its borders and administered the use of their own coinage as a quotidian reminder of their power. 
Jews resisted imperial hegemony on multiple occasions and minted coins of their own as a means of subverting outsider control. Using their own iconography, which was absent of ruler portraits, Jews asserted their tenuous but enduring presence in the region. When images on coins from this period are compared, they provide two sides of the same story, of control and resistance in ancient Judea. Initially, I wanted to simply study the coins and get a sense of the chronology and breadth of the collection. The staff at the Magnus were very welcoming in allowing me to explore and examine their coins for this purpose. It was Francesco Spaniola who suggested taking this research and contextualizing it within the larger scope of the collection, investigating the echoes of Jewish resistance from antiquity to the present. In this way, the ancient coins could speak to a much longer tradition of acts of everyday resistance. I hope you enjoy the exhibition and exploring these themes as well. Mm, thank you, Rebecca. So the exhibition is expanded from, from Rebecca's initial impetus, the expanded before our eyes. And we really plotted the collection in all kinds of directions. Um, a highlight that you can notice as you walk in is a very large painting by, by, by Creston that describes the imagined reaction to the Kishinev pogrom. Uh, imagine because as we will learn in a later, like in a couple of weeks, actually, just actually maybe just next week, in a lecture by Steve Zipperstein uh, here at the Magnus, uh, the uh, much of the of the reaction to the Kishinev pogrom was a literary reaction that, rather than a political one. Uh, but you see depicted in the, in the painting the younger guard, the younger generation. They 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 are modern. The only an, another mighty woman. The only person holding a weapon is a woman in the painting. And, uh, and where, whereas the, the older generation, you know, sporting their beards are cowering in the back and afraid to take action. Uh, that uh, incidentally, maybe not, maybe that was kind of my, my one specific contribution to the project, that the, the big vitrine under the, the big painting is littered with um, uh, Jewish communist propaganda from the 1920s. Uh, it's part of a very interesting archival collection at the Magnus, a, 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 a gentleman uh, that traveled to Eastern Europe in the 1920s, collected all kinds of uh, propaganda and, and publications that were done in the year that he spent there. He was raising funds, finding ways to raise funds to, uh, to help uh, refugees in the, in the interwar, meaning after World War I period. And, he, and, and a lot of these materials ended up in the Magnus and they are a real treasure trove. Uh, of, of um, lit communist literature and, and Zionist socialist literature in Yiddish, in, in, in English, and I'm sorry, in, 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 in German, in Russian, and, um, and also, as you will see, in Soviet Yiddish. And you can learn about that thanks to a, a very informative contribution by our colleague Yael Haver, who contributed to the exhibition as well. So as the exhibition expanded before our eyes, documenting the many echoes of the ancient resistance in Palestine that have helped into present times, it also afforded us the opportunity to showcase, and this is number two in my trifecta, artwork from the Toby family Arthur Schick collection that you heard about from uh, George Breslauer that was, uh, that was acquired by the Magnus in 2017 thanks to an unprecedented gift to UC Berkeley. This is probably Ted Toby calling me to congratulate us once again for this amazing coup. Thank you, Tata. Uh, um, and uh, wh wh whereas uh, the, the, a full-fledged exhibition on Arthur Schick will come, thanks to, among other things, to the efforts of my colleague and assistant curator, Schick Kohavi, in, to, in 2020, this fall, we can already appreciate not only Arthur Schick's mastery in miniature storytelling, but also how versatile and apropos his work continues to be today. It's very strong, poignant work. Last but not least in my 2018 fall trifecta was completed by the fact that the entire exhibition attracted the keen attention, the enthusiastic support, and luckily the benevolent criticism of my dear friend and eminent historian of late antiquity, Eric Grun. While in the past we've invited esteemed scholars to reflect upon individual items in the collection, 
I believe that this is the first time that a UC Berkeley scholar has taken upon himself to reflect on an entire exhibition project. I believe that in his remarks, Eric will focus on the mighty women highlighted in the project itself, Judith, Vashti, and Esther. But as I know Eric and the way he approaches the existential anxieties of late antiquity, we can only expect that these remarks will also raise a host of inspiring, if unsettling, questions, which may very well also relate to the existential and political anxieties and hopes of today. Please help me in joining and welcoming Professor Eric Grun to the podium. And let me just add a personal thank you for all of these wonderful questions about this project and for really being willing to engage with the objects in the collection, a pioneering effort in our work at the Magnus at UC Berkeley. Thank you, Eric. And you're I, Francesco, I don't know how existential my remarks are going to be. You put me in a, uh, an awkward situation here, but I'm pleased to be here because this is a wonderful exhibition and I hope that you'll have an opportunity to visit it more than once uh, because it's a, it's a rich, diverse, and in many ways very evocative uh, uh, exhibition that Francesco and his colleagues have put together very intelligently and very sensitively. Now, there's, let me see if I can be heard, if I turn around. The, uh, there's a fascinating object in this uh, collection and in this exhibit. Ah, it's there. It calls forth the theme that motivates the exhibition, the piece de resistance. It is a Hanukkah lamp. Now Hanukkah, as we all know, celebrates a magnificent moment of Jewish resistance. The successful rebellion of the Maccabees against their evil overlord and persecutor Antiochus IV, ruler of the Seleucid kingdom of Syria. But this lamp, however, does not depict Judah Maccabee, as one might have expected, or any of the freedom fighters of the Maccabean Rebellion, but a woman, and not just any woman. It is Judith brandishing the sword and holding the head of Holofernes, which she has just cut off, the head of the Assyrian host, that had attacked and assaulted Judea. Actually, according to the story, she took the head and plopped it into a bag. Uh, but never mind that detail. <laughs> Question is, what is Judith doing on a uh, Hanukkah image, Hanukkah lamp? She has nothing to do with the Maccabean <coughs> uprising that took place several centuries later. Well, there's an obvious reason that suggests itself immediately, of course. Judith is an icon for resistance, the resistance to oppressive authority, as is Judah Maccabee, such an image, the hero of the Hanukkah narrative. So this triumphant gesture by Judith, it's a kind of fist pump, one might say, and resistance, of course, is what this exhibition <coughs> is all about. But Judith is an iconic figure in more ways than one. She's a woman. She's a woman of great resolve, resourcefulness, and success, echoing in her own way the achievements of biblical heroines like Deborah and Yael, Yael, many of you know, did away with her oppressor, the Canaanite general Sisera, not by a neat sword stroke, but by pounding a tent peg into his skull. <laughs> a rather more grisly uh, exhibit of 
removing your oppressor. Now, the question I'm asking here is, is the tale of Judith emblematic not only of resistance to imperial oppression, but also to social oppression of women in a patriarchal society? Is it a form of feminist resistance, the creation of these estimable and powerful female figures as a kind of counterpoint to the prevailing social circumstances that kept women in subordinate and dependent positions? And that is the way it is often understood. Well, in the brief time that I have here, I want to look at three women in Jewish literature of antiquity, each of whom appears in the piece de resistance exhibition, and each of whom has been taken as an exemplary instance of feminine defiance of male domination. I want to begin with a figure in the book of Esther, uh, about whom we don't hear all that much, namely Vashti, wife of the Persian king Ahasuerus. And we're fortunate to have a rather striking image of her here uh, by the Ukrainian artist Isakhar Rybak from 1921. Here she appears in obviously a rather comic um, costume and appearance, presumably from a Purim celebration. Uh, Francesco tells me this is actually a man in the guise of the woman. We, sorry? It's a okay, there you are. <laughs> now, Vashti in the tale appears only very briefly, only fleetingly, but with meaningful overtones and resonance. The king was entertaining a large host of his courtiers and officials in a lavish banquet. This image has about, I guess, 25 or so around the table. According to the tale of Esther, there were hundreds that had come at the invitation of the king from all over the empire. And to culminate the entertainment, the king summoned the, his ravishing queen, Vashti. She didn't look all that ravishing in this image, but never mind. She is in the story. He summoned her to appear before his guests and to exhibit her beauty for the guests. Now, the rabbis, in commenting on this passage centuries later, added a salacious element to it, saying that Vashti appeared in the nude. That is not in the text of the book of Esther. But the rabbis uh, like to tell their own tale here. Uh, in any case, Vashti rejected the king's request, refused to parade herself before his guests. And so she's become, a kind, uh, she's become symbolic of female resistance to the power structure. Her refusal, according to the tale, produced a, whole, a crisis in the whole realm. The king's ministers panicked over the repercussions of this rebuff. If Vashti can get away with this, they said, will there be any household in the land in which the women won't take over? She has to be made an example of. So the courtiers pressured the king into issuing a proclamation that wives everywhere should obey and respect the authority of their husbands and that men must be masters in their own homes. All over the empire, Persian empire. So this is a somewhat over the top reaction, but then much in the book of Esther is over the top. And what happened to Vashti? She was prohibited from ever being in the king's presence again. 
Here too, this was not quite good enough for the rabbis. Uh, some of the Midrashim take this a step further and uh, assert that she was executed. That too, uh, there's nothing in the text of Esther to support that. The rabbis always seem to, often seem to feel a need to embellish a story that was already good enough, but let's make it even better. <laughs> but does the author really see Vashti as a standard bearer for women's rights in a social and political world that is otherwise ruled by men. One would like to think so, and it is often interpreted in this fashion. Yet if that is the author's intent, it simply doesn't work very well. Yes, the queen refused to uh, serve as a sex object. She did not want to appear before the king's guests and be ogled by them like a concubine. She preferred even to lose her crown rather than be a mere plaything paraded before the gaze of men. But the notion that the author of the book of Esther was a kind of proto-feminist uh, isn't really persuasive. The scene itself is designed as a rather hilarious mockery of the fatuousness of the royal court and the ridiculous ruler who feared that the entire structure, social structure of the empire would collapse unless Vashti were banished. So these proclamations that demanded wifely submission in every home of the realm at it by a king who couldn't even enforce it in his own home only underscores the absurdity of that situation and that is what the author I think is trying to present. This is not a serious social commentary. It is not a serious gender commentary. What's interesting here is that uh, once Vashti is banished from the court, she disappears from the scene is never heard from again in the rest of the book of Esther. This happens right at the very beginning of it or near it. Given that, Vashti, I think, can hardly be, she can hardly carry the burden of uh, making a case for women's liberation. But what about the real heroine of the story, Esther? Esther herself. Now the tale of Esther and the festival of Purim that derive from it uh, are familiar to just about everybody. I don't need to recount it uh, for you in any detail. As you all know, after the banishment of Vashti, Ahasuerus held what was in effect a beauty contest to determine her successor. And the, comp the competition was to decide not only who was the fairest in the land, but also who was the best in bed. Each one of the contestants, after a year's worth of cosmetic treatments in the harem, would then spend a night with the king. In other words, this setting was very far from a feminine manifesto. It was a spoof of the seraglio. Esther the Jewess, of course, won the contest. And uh, she then became the king's consort on a regular basis. And a good thing too, because she proved to be the right woman in the right place at the right time. When Ahasuerus' villainous grand vizier, Haman, um, uh, got the king to pass a basically a genocidal decree that would eradicate every Jew in the realm, Esther, as the queen and the favorite of the king, uh, was in a position to get him to rescind that genocidal decree. And as I'm sure you all know, Mordecai, her uncle or cousin, there's dispute about that, doesn't matter, um, was elevated to a uh, a position, a, a prominent and conspicuous position because of the, he had saved the king's life by uh, reporting a conspiracy against him. 
riding triumphantly on the horse. I'm not sure that I can see it. The horse is supposed to have a crown on his head. Uh, that's what the tail says. Whether it's there or not in the uh, image, I'm not quite obvious. Isn't quite obvious. But Haman, of course, who had decreed uh, the genocidal decree of the uh, for the Jews, and also had Mordecai in mind as the chief, as his chief villain, had built a gallows, 75 feet high in the air on which Mordecai was to hang, and of course, in fact, it was Haman who was hanged from that gallows. And uh, the Jews were then authorized to take up arms against their enemy by the king, which they did with gusto, slaying 75,000 of them without losing a single man, and everyone lived happily ever after. <laughs> except, I guess, those 75,000. Um, this scene, which portrays a, uh, a Purim celebration uh, designed to uh, commemorate the triumph of Mordecai and Esther, the defeat of Haman, and this rescue of the Jews, as you all know. So now the question I want to raise is, was Esther a champion of resistance to the political order, a woman who opposed the uh, social structure, who rescued the Jews, who demonstrated the effectiveness of female power? Not exactly. Esther hardly comes across as a person of authority and decisiveness. Take, for instance, the promulgation of Haman's decree for mass extermination of the Jews. When the news arrived in the palace, or in the area of the palace, Mordecai was desperate, went into abject mourning, tore his hair, ripped up his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes. And when Esther learns of what Mordecai has done, what did she do? She sent him a new set of clothes. <laughs> Not quite um, uh, clear on the concept. Esther is a little bit, uh, has hardly a clue about what's going on, in fact. Not a, not a uh, forceful entrance onto the scene. Esther simply does not emerge as a forceful personality of any kind, or an independent agent for that matter. She appears first as the consort of Ahasuerus, awaiting his pleasure for a summons to the court. Then, as the dutiful ward of Mordecai, who insists that she use her position, and evidently also her um, sexual allure, to induce the king to reverse himself and uh, in the edict that decreed Jewish annihilation. Now, to be sure, Esther does in the end persuade the king to rescind his decree. But what really turned the tide was not Esther's uh, scheming, not Esther's blandishments, but a altogether unanticipated and rather bizarre episode. When Esther identified Haman to the king as the real culprit here, the king went out for a walk. Why, I don't know. Perhaps to compose himself before he decided upon his next step. But when he was out of the room, Haman threw himself upon Esther's mercy. Rather, literally threw himself. So that when the king returned, he found Haman sprawled on the couch where Esther was reclining. And it was then that the king assumed he had come upon a sexual assault and lowered the boom on Haman. With Esther as 
an ostensible victim, not as an active agent in the scene. In other words, Haman met his end and the Jews were saved, not so much because Esther was clever or resourceful, but because the clueless king mistook Haman's appeal to clemency for a rape scene. This converts potential tragedy into farce. This is not a triumph for womanhood. The scroll of Esther concludes with Mordecai elevated to the post of second in command of the Persian king, the right-hand man of Ahasuerus. He was esteemed, says the text, by all of his fellow Jews, a man who strived for the welfare of his people. So the Jews prevailed over their enemies, but only by committing some mass slaughter of their own. The 75,000 victims. And where is Esther in all this? presumably back in the harem. In any event, she certainly resumed her post as chief consort to Ahasuerus. The Gentile king was still in charge. He had rid himself of a wicked advisor and the Jewish subjects of his kingdom had survived, but they were still subjects. This is not a subversive tale whether on political or on gender grounds. In the end, the status quo prevails. The Persian king governs his empire and the Jewish wife returns to her dutiful place in the royal household. Well, let me turn now to a different text with a much more forceful woman. I refer to the book of Judith which delivers an edifying and uplifting message, the rescue of the Jews from the brink of disaster by a clever, beautiful, and pious woman who upholds the faith and traps the enemy general personally and lops off his head as a prize. The scene, of course, is a favorite one uh, for artists uh, repeatedly over the centuries, uh, by Jew and Gentile alike, by the way. Uh, there's hardly a museum in Europe that doesn't have some representation of, of Judith holding the head of Holofernes, just as on the Hanukkah lamp that I began with, and on the other image, which is an 18th century British engraving, in which, which is pretty graphic with uh, the blood flowing from Holofernes' body. Uh, the tale of, her, of Judith's accomplishments against all odds and over the aggrandizer and the oppressor has had immense appeal throughout the ages. Uh, it, its hold on popular imagination has never <coughs> abated. Let me give you if I may, a brief recapitulation of the highlights of the story. It's not as familiar as the Esther tale, so I spent a couple of minutes on it. The context of this tale, which is wholly imaginary, by the way, is a putative military campaign ordered by the egomaniacal ruler Nebuchadnezzar. The captain of his host, Holofernes, swept through the land, slaughtering or subjugating all those in his path until he came to the small Jewish town called Betulia, also almost certainly a fictitious place, somewhere on a mountain. We don't know exactly where it's even supposed to be. But Holofernes, with his vast army, laid siege to the place and cut off the water supply. The citizens of Betulia swiftly became desperate, pleaded with their leaders to surrender. They preferred slavery to death. And Uzziah, the most uh, prominent of the leaders, said, wait a minute, and he proposed a five-day wait in the hope, with a lot of prayers, that God would show up within the five days. But he did promise that if, no, if there was no sign of God, 
uh, coming onto the premises or exercising his authority, then they would surrender on the fifth day. Well, it was at this point that Judith enters the scene. Wealthy and respected widow with a string of illustrious ancestors. Her piety was awesome. She had been fasting for three and a half years <laughs> after her husband died. Uh, she, well, she ate twice a, uh, twice a week and on holidays, but otherwise, a total fast. A, this was an exercise in piety that bordered on anorexia. <laughs> uh, Judith arrived, flailed the elders of the city with rebuke, said to them, who are you to threaten surrender if the Lord does not come to your rescue? And within five days, as if you're putting him to the test. What kind of arrogance is this, she said, to set a deadline to God? Judith proclaimed, she'll deal with the situation herself, so long as nobody inquires as to just how she was going to do it. So Uzziah and the other officials, uh, and the other officials of the city gave her free reign, since they hadn't been able to do anything. Uh, Judith first prayed to God, she prays often in the text, and then took matters into her own hands. A beautiful as well as a wise woman, she cast off her sackcloth and her widow's garb, she'd been wearing for three and a half years, did up her hair, put on jewelry and perfume, bedecked herself in the most alluring outfit. She marched through the gates of the city, uh, with a single maidservant, headed straight for the camp of Holofernes. Thereupon, she captivated the general, not only with her looks, but with a beguiling and manipulative language. Holofernes bought it all. He invited her to his tent after a couple of days, where Judith roused his desire and then she watched as he drank himself into a stupor. And when the intoxicated general passed out, Judith, armed with prayer and a sword, took his head from him, as the text rather delicately puts it. She then dropped the head into the sack that she had brought for the purpose, slipped away from the camp, Bought her, brought her prize to Betulia, where the city fathers displayed the head of Holofernes on the battlements of the wall. Judith received plaudits from the citizenry of Betulia and even from the high priest in Jerusalem who learned of this. But she declined any further honors, declined any further glory. The devout widow chose to retire to her estate. She emancipated her loyal attendant declined all offers of marriage from eager suitors to live out the rest of her days in serenity. And there were many such days. She died at the ripe old age of 105. Well, that's the gist of the story. The solemn religiosity of Judith underpins the whole narrative. Her successes, uh, uh, are always accompanied by prayers to Yahweh and humble obeisance to his uh, presumed will. And as the story indicates, God smites not only the wicked enemy, but frowns on the faltering Israelites. They can take a lesson from their devout heroine. But there's more to it than that. This is not a mere feminist tract. I will skip a couple of pages because time is, and I want to press the time. But what's most interesting in a way is the conclusion of the story, which is especially revealing. Judith's remarkable deed 
had not only humbled the enemy and rescued her people, it had also humiliated the Israelites or the Israelite leadership, exposed their inadequate faith in God, their lack of judgment, their cowardice in war, and their incompetence in policy. As a woman who had outstripped the male establishment, she had turned the whole conventional structure on its head. So this story would seem to make a very good case for female leadership and for a new order of women's power. Yet in the end, Judith reverted in an important sense to the same marginality from which she had come in Jewish society. She returned to her own estate. She turned down all offers of marriage. She never intervened again in the affairs of state. And maybe most interesting, when she died, she was buried in the tomb of her husband. So the woman who had used sex and deceit to outwit her enemies and to shame her male compatriots returned inconspicuously to convention and normality. The last two-thirds of her life found her once more proper, respectable, and emblematic of the status quo. So to conclude, the three figures that I've tried to present in these narratives, despite common perception, do not carry a banner for female power, nor do they make a dent in Jewish patriarchal society. Yes, sex plays a role in each of the uh, tales. Vashti's charms, whether clothed or unclothed, were to be put on display for the pleasure of the king's courtiers until she abruptly refused, uh, refused to become part of the entertainment. Uh, Esther's pulchritude won her the uh, Miss Persia contest, we might say, um, and put her in a position to influence the king in rescuing the, her fellow Jews. And Judith, of course, employed her feminine wiles to seduce the Assyrian general and to set him up for the kill. But these radiant ladies hardly exemplify liberated women paradigms of empowerment, or a stimulus for female claims on leadership roles in Jewish society. Vashti's snub of the king's request does make a clear statement, but she then vanishes from the scene and the narrative and never to return. Esther, after the Jews' triumph, resumes her place as compliant queen of the Gentile king. And Judith returns to private life, content with preserving the memory of her deceased spouse. The conventional social and gender structures remained intact. What these stories remind us of, I think, most pointedly is that they must have been composed by men. Thank you.